The views and opinions expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of Salem Media of Hawaii. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is BeFit for Health. Uh, I am Bianca, your host, and we're going to have another great show for you. It's a uh it's dear to my heart because uh, this person that I brought into the studio today is a good friend of mine, and uh, I'm excited to share him with you today. But before I get started, I wanted to remind all of you as to what my journey is with this show. You know, I started this, uh, I believe, in April, and uh, before I began, I had a vision, and the vision was that I wanted to... Um, you know, set out and help people understand their health and well-being. Most people aren't connected to their bodies. They don't understand what's going on. They don't know the questions to ask the doctors. They don't know, you know, what they're seeking in order for them to find a balanced lifestyle and for them to feel better. And at some point, you know, most people give up. And that's where I'm here to help you and to, to get you to that next step where maybe I can help you find your direction and help you get those questions answered and maybe give you a quality of life that you've been seeking. And this mission that I have and this vision that I have is going to be with me for the duration of the show. And I'm bringing on people like that who also want to help others and also seek, you know, the, the journey with me, you know, in their path to find ways to help others live a quality life and a balanced life and also find solutions to, you know, areas of, of problem areas where you may not be able to, figure out yourselves. So we're here to support you with the show. We're here to find the solutions with you on the show. So please tell your friends um, to tune in on Sundays at 10 o'clock so that we can help them as well. It's very important. Uh, the more people that get onto the show and listen, the more people that we can help. So it's really, really important. Um, I'm really excited because uh, before we head on to the commercial, um, I want to be able to introduce, um, you know, who really is here. And, you know, it isn't every day that you get to sit in the studio with a a big humanitarian, someone who cares deeply about the human race and really wants to put out every possible way he can, information, education, you know, enlightenment, um, you know, connecting people to um, areas in which they may not even know that exist. And, and for me and for Hawaii, we're lucky we have him here and uh, living here with us. But at the same time, this man has also influenced a lot of people all over the world. You know, he's not only served, uh, you know, his country, he's also been an athlete. He's also been out there advocating for so many underprivileged individuals that have gone through so much trauma in their lives. And I'm talking like people who've gone through genocide, you know, women who've gone through crises, uh, through pregnancies, um, you know, pro, pro-life, pro pro-activation, activate to help others control things that may not be controllable. Um or they might not find that they are in a place where they can control things that are happening in their lives. Um, he's also produced movies. I mean, I'm talking big time movies. In 2006, he he actually won awards for uh, People Choice Awards for Bella. He produced a film called Bella in 2006, and he also produced another movie in 2009 where he won the film festival uh, award. Uh, with uh, you know the movie, I believe it was um, was it Mother Marion. The Stoning of Soraya M. Ah, God, sorry. It's a hard one to pronounce. It is. I'm so sorry. I, I missed that one. But, you know, he's also helping people that are homeless. Um, so he's he's definitely humanitarian. He's doing so much more. I'm going to actually have him explain his life story. It is way beyond this paper. It is way beyond what I can say because I didn't live his life and I didn't live his journey. But he's done so much for so many people that I couldn't do him justice and the person I'm talking about is Jason Scott Jones. I mean, this man is a legend here. He he knows everybody. Everyone knows him. And if you don't know him, you should look him up because you'd be quite impressed as to see who he is and what he's done. But before we get him on that microphone, I'm going to take a really quick break. And then when we come back, I've got a slew of questions heading your way. So you better be ready. All right. The Honolulu Club is still here for you. We are providing the safest workout conditions on the island. 
with modified safe distancing indoor and outdoor classes. Large open work floor with clean sanitized machines and free weights. Let the Honolulu Club be your one and only fitness destination. Go to HonoluluClub.com and fill out the trial pass today. Have you heard of microcurrent therapy? If you suffer from chronic pain, arthritis, sports injuries, ligament injuries, or migraines, the Electro Equiscope can help. This non-invasive treatment system is drug-free and shows no negative side effects. If you are seeking pain relief and want to boost your immune system, schedule a demonstration or consultation by calling Kelly, your microcurrent electrotoxologist, at 485-9697 or follow on Instagram at Kelly's Time. Make your appointment today. All right, we're back. We're back with Mr. Jones. We're really excited here. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention about his background, he's the president of Move to Movement, and he's a human rights um, education organization called Hero. He He's trying his best to help people find ways to live a better life, and he's also written books, um, Race to Save Our Century. That was his first book, and it's uh, and basically he's... He's someone who's trying to figure out different ways, different ways to reach to people, whether you read books, m- watch movies, um, want him in person to to educate you on things. And um, so today we have him here in the studio, and I'd like all of you to give him a round of applause for wherever you are, to, to Jason Jones. Thank you. Welcome, buddy. I appreciate it's, you uh, taking the time today. No, it's a privilege to be on your show. Wow, man, this is this is my privilege. Are you kidding me? Um, I know you on a on a personal level. You're you're a good friend, and um, I had no idea you've done some of the things that you've done. Can you um, take me a little bit to uh, your your beginnings? I mean, I know you were an athlete. You used to compete, mm-hmm. and tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, for me, I think we, all of us when we're young, we have our passion. So I was. I had a, a football in my hand. I remember maybe I was six years old, and my I was my mom had me when she was sixteen. So you can imagine, lived on the south side of Chicago, and I saw a, a, a Pop Warner football team at the Dairy Queen. So it was me alone with my mom, like six years old, and I see this team. They have uniforms, they have pads, and they had a coach, this male figure there. And my dad had left when I was about two and wasn't going to be back for about another year till I was seven. He was in the military overseas. So, and they, they never were married or divorced. Maybe they were married for like three months as 16 year olds. And uh, that attracted me. So, what first attracted me to sports, I knew nothing about football. I just knew that was a football team. There were a bunch of guys together that looked really happy. They're eating ice cream. And there's this big, burly guy that was like their coach. And I cried. When we got in the car, I cried. I said, Mom, I said, Mom, sign me up for football. She's like, no. I cried and I cried and I cried. So she agreed. Next season, y- you can join. So I couldn't wait. I started reading books on football. I'm like seven, you know, the little kids' books on Tony Dorsett and all these football players. You can get these little kids' books. I started watching football. So my attraction to football, when I th- reflect on it, it was really I was attracted to camaraderie to a community and that was my love. So from about the age of seven until 17, I had a football in my hand. Nice. In class, I just doodled plays. <laughs> I studied football and was not a good student. I was not a good kid. I mean, I had a lot of problems. and But the one place I didn't have problems was if, the one place I would be disciplined, the one place I would do what I was told by adults the one place where I respected the adults around me was 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 football, and also at around fifth grade I got really I saw it's again I I was on one of those channels. Remember there was the two channels, the dial. I don't know if you're old enough, but there used to be the I'm two. Older than you? <laughs> no, no. All right, then whatever she's selling, buy. Okay, so then you remember there were the two channels. Right. There was the one channel that we had like that had kung fu movies and like Japanese robots fighting right. lizards, right? Okay, remember, I remember that. Do you remember that channel? Yes, okay. Yes. So I was flipping around on that channel. Channel 11 or something like that. I can't remember. Well, no, there was like 100 channels. It was called the UVF channel. There was this dial, which was like CBS, NBC, 
and ABC, right? The NPBS, right? Then the other one is you just click around. There'd be oh, Korean television, that. yes, and now Spanish I language yes. television, and then for me, there'd be Kung Fu Theater. <laughs> remember that? Yes. Okay. So there was a documentary. I tell you, I remember it. This is why I'm into movies. Movies impacted me. It was called Fighting Black Kings, and it was on the first. Full contact, bare knuckle martial arts tournament in the world in 1972 in Tokyo, Japan. And there were these big, strong, athletic black guys from New York. And it was called Fighting Black Kings. They were going to Japan to fight in the Kyokushin Kai Kans. Uh, first world tournament that was going to be the Olympics of full contact, bare knuckle, knockdown fighting. And I watched that and I said, one day I'm going to do that. Wow. One day I'm going to represent my country and that thing. And uh, so then I got into, but, but okay, now it's the south side of Chicago. So where am I going to take martial arts? Right. So I took judo at the YMCA. And then I started wrestling in, in junior high. And then I, there would be like the weird guy, the really big fat white guy that taught Kempo in Chinatown, you know, and you'd go to Chinatown. But it was too much. And my mom could never pay for more than two or three months at a time. Then there was the Marine that taught Wadoru Karate. Wow. And I and I could only do that maybe for five months. My mom let me do that, and I'd do a tournament and I'd win. But and I'd buy books like the Karate Kid, and I'd be Masoyama, who was the founder of this thing in Japan. I'd got all his books. Don't tell anyone, but I would walk like three miles to the mall and steal these books. So I owe Masoyama money. You're still telling me not to tell anyone, but you are on the radio. So. Wait, this is being recorded. I didn't sign a consent form. I did not sign a consent. So um, so yeah, I would steal these karate. I had the best martial arts library in the 1980s you know every o'hare publishing and i'd get black belt magazine so martial arts was from after football season until football season is what i obsessed on and during football season and all year round too i mean i was obsessed with football football was my passion and i was a very good football player i was a heavily recruited football player my inciting incident in my life is intimately involved in sports. I was last in my class in high school. I got no credit my second semester, my junior year, zero credits. Wow. Because I just didn't go to school. And I don't know what I was thinking because, of course, I wasn't eligible for football. So to be eligible for my senior year, I had to take five classes, which was impossible, but not. So what I did is I, there were only two classes you could take at my high school. I took two classes at a Catholic high school. And I went to a community college. Mm. So I took five classes. This was very expensive. But my high school girlfriend was from the right, she was from a very wealthy family, and she just paid for it. She said, I'll get the wow. money. So my high school girlfriend just paid for these. For what me. an investment. She yeah. had no idea that investing in you like that would turn and out like this And she's still my now. friend. You yeah. know, yeah, we're still, and well, well, the story takes a strange twist. So I was eligible for football uh, after, you know, this one teacher was so mad what seeing me walk off the practice field before school started because she was so excited that I would suffer consequences. And that was one thing I've been blessed with in life is up until now, or maybe not, but I, I do, it appears that I escape the consequences of my actions. So, you know, the teacher was so upset. How did you, you're not supposed to be playing, you're ineligible. I'm like, no, I'm eligible. I took five classes. That's impossible. Well, I did it. So when I put my mind to something, even as this kid, you did it. I did it, especially for sports. Because sports to me was how I had community, how I had friends, how I could prove I'm a good man. Yeah. I didn't value teachers. I didn't value school. But I valued my opinion of my coaches. I valued the opinion of my teammates. And as a young man, I wanted to be competitive. In school, we weren't allowed to be competitive. We weren't, you know, it was so if I can't compete, I'm not interested. That's how I just was as a boy. Different times, too. And now I really am sorrowful for young men like me, young boys like me from broken homes who are looking for a place to express them who they are. Right. That we're taking those that away from them. We're really yeah. robbing them. So my senior year of high school, playing football, and I'm having a good season. I'm being recruited, figuring out to be Proposition 48. But again, I knew I knew ways to get around that. It's it was I might I wouldn't be eligible for a Division One scholarship because of my grades again, but I knew of some schools that had ways around that that I was talking to. But two days before my seventeenth birthday, my high school girlfriend rode her bicycle to my house with the news she's pregnant. Oh no! Yeah, 
But that's not how I took it, strangely enough. How I took it was, I get to be a fa- I'm a father. I get to have a family. I also, it was my daydream since a kid because my parents had me in high school, didn't stick together for long, and I lived between two worlds. Right. My mom had a lot of husbands and a lot of kids. I wanted one world. Right. My world. Right. So to me, this was game on. And my high school girlfriend was from a broken, uh, not a broken family, but a very abusive family. Wow. So from privilege, from a very famous, very influential, well-known Chicago family. And um, so we conspired that we would get married, have the baby, and I would drop out of high school and join the army on my birthday. So on my 17th birthday, I joined the army. Wow. And went off to basic training. It was for juvenile delinquents. It was a special cohort. You could only go in the infantry. And being last in my class and having 80 hours of detention the semester before and other things. <laughs> You're a little rascal. I qualified for wow. this program. Wow. Very elite wow. program. Went off to Fort Benning, Georgia, and was just was so excited. Here I am, an infantryman. As much as I loved football, this is bigger. In fact, I had thought, I'll do the three years in the Army. We'll get Katie through school. Then I'll go to college. I'll only be 20. And when I get out of my first contract, and then I'll play ball. So I just didn't think I was giving up football. And even when I got to my duty station, was at Schofield, I would be running routes. I'd be working out. Uh, I still had this idea that I'd play football again. But uh, before I was right before I was about to come home from graduating basic training, Katie was in her third trimester. I get a phone call on a Saturday morning. I was cleaning pots and pans. I wasn't supposed to be getting calls this Sunday. I had extra duty. Um, a friend ran in and said, your girlfriend's on the phone crying. She called for you. She was crying like I have never heard anyone cry. And the way I say this, her soul was crying. And she just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then her father said, we know your secret and your secret's gone. I took Katie to get an abortion. Oh, that's so sad. So being a kid that wasn't raised with religion or politics, didn't pay attention in school, there was no Google, there was no cable news, I didn't know what abortion was. My captain explained to me, and it was unimaginable. Right. It's just, I couldn't believe it. It just struck me as unreal. It's not a real thing that the most vulnerable member of the human family, our own child in the womb, would be legally exposed to violence. It just didn't make sense. So for me, that was what I would call my inciting incident. It changed me. People who knew me before that experience and after said I went from being, uh, especially during my military years, very happy-go-lucky. In basic training, I was voted the best guy. I forget what it was called, but like the your, your your favorite the favorite recruit, right? Um, because I would wake up singing, I would sing all day, and after that, for a long time, I became very serious, very angry. Um, Diff- my friends say, Jason, the difference between you before that phone call and after that phone call is unbelievable. Well, like for any anybody, it's a deciding factor of who you become for the rest of your life. Something that dramatic can alter your soul's journey or set you right. I mean, it just sets something that bad and dramatic can set you on the right path that you were born to be uh, doing. So, as as terrible of a of a incident as that is for anyone to experience because I've had a few friends that experienced it crying on my lap I I never had to but thank God um, but I was there for friends who did and it changes a person's soul it does it your your mindset and you grew up fast and I can only imagine how fast you grew up that at that moment Um, because you realize what life the meaning of life and the quality of life and where it sits versus where it was before, because you were still a kid up until that point. Yeah, I mean, for me, that was that was it. That's changed everything. So in filmmaking, we would call that my inciting incident, or Joseph Campbell, the great guy, he was from Hawaii, he lived a lot of his life in Hawaii. The literary critic Joseph Campbell would call it the, the uh, call to adventure. That was my inciting incident of my... Your aha moment. That was basically. everything. Yeah, yeah, it was... I. I I wanted from that moment on, well, then it was just a couple months later, I was sent to Schofield Barracks, blessed to come to Hawaii and stationed here. And it's Hawaii saved my life. This angry young man, 
I got three Article 15s my first year for fighting. Yeah, so I knew if I lived in the barracks, I would end up in prison or kicked out of the army. Wow. So I, at the time, we still had plantations. So I paid money to live with plantation workers to have my little bunk out there in Wahiwa. So I would leave as soon as there was last final formation. I would leave because all my trouble happened being around the barracks in off true. hours. Yeah. I was like, you can tell me what to do off hours, but if I'm laying on my bunk reading a book at 8 p.m. and you ask me to mop, we're going to get in a fight. Yeah. So I was like, I have to get out of here. And so then I kind of was embraced by the community, my high school girlfriend and I, the traumatic experience that was the end of us. Right. Her father actually sent her off to boarding school and he made her write a letter to me, a Dear John letter. I was going to say. And that broke my heart. But then I met a girl here in Wahiwa at Zippy's. And then a year later, so here I am now 18, I have a son, and then 19, I have a daughter. And that changed everything too. Right. That's when I cut my son's umbilical cord, that year and a half of like volatile anger just- Went away. And a, and a lot of it, a lot of it, yeah. It, things became clean. But then the other experience that kind of united with the abortion was that I was on Cobra Gold, which if you were in the military and you were, you were in Hawaii, you were on Cobra Gold. It's a an annual training exercise in Thailand. And I was in an infantry unit and we were doing cordon searches on the border of Cambodia in these little villages in the mountains. And there was a father whose son was very sick and my interpreter thought he was dying from malaria. I don't know what it was. But I saw the look in the father's eyes. And I, it was like I was looking in my own eyes because it was just three months after the abortion. And that's when I said to myself that day in Thailand, 17-year-old soldier that I'm 60 on his back. I said, this man is helpless. I will never be helpless again. I'm an American. I can make money. I can get an education. We live in a constitutional republic. I can influence politics. I can influence culture. I can write books. I can make movies. I thought all of this. Wow. And it was then, as a 17-year-old, I said, I want to order my life to help the helpless. I don't want anyone to look like how my eyes must look down to people. And how that guy's eyes look to me, I don't want anyone to ever look like that again. And it's been my obsession. It addles me. That's, um, you know, the biggest thing for me as well. I think I was very lucky to be raised by a father who was very enlightened and have a brother who's very enlightened. You choose to be a victim or you choose to be the hero um, in your life. And, and no matter what your circumstance is, it's a choice. And the way that you live your life is a choice. Um, you know, we all get to choose our paths. No one has to choose it for us. We let them if, if that happens. It's because you're choosing for them to choose it for you. And everything that happens to you is something that you allow. Because even if it happens without your uh, understanding at that moment, how you react and what you choose to do after the fact is again your choice and circumstances happen but your reaction is very important and you can either make something beautiful out of it even though it's terrible or you can become even worse and, and just go to the depths of hell because you you can't seem to uh, get out of it and your mindset the strength of your constitution the strength of your mind the strength of your soul is all based on your awareness that you have this free will to choose and you're not a victim no matter what happens to you and I know this from firsthand I know this also from my father's life and journey his life was very uh, similar he didn't have much of an education he lived in a third world country he had a skill set but at a very young age he became a father and and made choices and my father brought us to one of the most beautiful states in the United States and we lived in a very nice area in, in Hawaii with a fifth grade education. Wow. You know, everything is a choice. And my father looked at me when I moved to L.A. for seven years. And he said to me, look, we're not holding you back. If you want to be successful, it's your choice. Don't blame us for things that are not happening for you because they were very conservative. They were very old school, you know, traditional. And I always felt like as a female in a in a cultured family I was restricted but that was my mindset I had to change that and no matter what I did and where where I went I was very successful why because I chose to be yeah 
and your success in up to this point was that aha moment for you and you realized I think at that moment with that gentleman I'm not going to choose to live the life I've had I'm going to choose to live a life of a hero for yourself and for your family and for the people that you meet and I think that's that's the most amazing gift you gave yourself whether it be divine intervention whether it be your 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 you know your god your your angels or whether it be your soul telling you this is it let's get let's get busy yeah no i mean i think all of us have had really bad things happen to us right everyone everyone you meet you know in hawaii uh you think of to me like the worst things that can happen you lose your child to a drunk driving accident or you have to watch a child that you adore, you love, your child suffer and die from a childhood illness like cancer uh, or um, a sex abuse as you suffered sexual abuse as a child. These, these things to me are the, the unimaginable betrayal yeah. of that. One in four young women in Hawaii suffer abuse by the time they're 18. One in six men. So when you look at the worst thing that could happen to us, the worst things that happen to us. What do, there's something, it's hard to say and it's hard to hear, but the beautiful thing that comes from it. I had a friend who I love, lost her son to uh, a hit and run. And the son was the light of her life, was the light of her family, was really the light of our community, a lot of us in Hawaii. And, it, and you know, I said to her, this is gonna be a hard thing for you to hear, but you're the only person, in the, this is gonna happen again and again and again to people. And you will be the only person that they can talk to. Mm-hmm. That's what the empathy, that if you've suffered these horrible things, that you will be able to care for someone else more effectively. You will be able to listen more thoughtfully and, and you'll be able to give advice from a position of understanding. So once we understand it as a Christian, Christ, my Christian faith helped me, I was an atheist till I was 30, helped me understand that really I'm, we're called to order our life to share the burdens that others are carrying. And not that it's their burden. Because the, the, the consequences of social sin and personal sin fall on us unequally. Right? So a lot of people are walking around carrying way more than their fair share of the burden. Sure. And once we understand that it's our job to when we can not be do-gooders, not to go around looking to help, you know, but but when we are in a position to help somebody sh- sh- shoulder some of the burden that they're shouldering that's not theirs, it's ours, but it's on their shoulders. That is how to live a good life. You know, when I get interviewed a lot lately, strange about being a success, how you become successful. I'm like, I don't think I'm a success in the world's eyes. I mean, I've written books. And they've been okay. They've done well. I've written, made movies, and they've won awards. But I'm not wealthy. I'm middle class, you know. I um, but I am. To me, I've, I'm. Thank God. I don't. I wouldn't trade places with anyone. I have the best friends in the world. I love my vocation. Uh, I love my community. I have seven children and two grandchildren. So I am, to me, a success. What the world calls success, a lot of times, I think they mean monetary. Monetary. Yeah. And um, what's great about our community in Hawaii, and I'm so glad it helped form me working in the entertainment business. I'm, I work around the richest, literally the richest and literally the most powerful and literally the most famous people in the world. Uh, li- like, one of my movies was funded by the richest man in the world. Um, and one of my movies I made with Justin Bieber's mom. And she's my friend, Patty Millette. <clears throat> so I'm around. Very wealthy, very famous, very powerful people. I wouldn't want that, any of that. No, it's a burden it's in a some burden. ways. Yeah. It's a duty. It's a yeah. severe responsibility yeah. that I'm not man enough, virtuous enough, Christian enough to shoulder that in a way that wouldn't destroy my soul and I would be horrible at it. So, yeah, but we live in a community. That I, I, I lost my, I have ADD. You'll see that. So <laughs> I lost my place. Okay, I'll guide you back. Don't so worry. So guide me back. But, but my point is that I'm glad I moved here at 17 because... I can never be seduced away. Like Hollywood will never seduce me away from yeah. what's truly valuable. Yeah. I, I used to get mad in the 90s when I'd see all these kids from Hawaii going on reality shows. 
Oh, I remember those. Areas. And they'd all leave. Yeah. The kid from O-Town. He could have been the star of O-Town, right? When he got this million-dollar contract. He was a banquet waiter in Waikiki. And I was like, this dummy, take the contract. And he's like, I miss my brother. And, you know, they were showing him holding Muay Thai, which is my passion. His brother, I remember this. I was rooting for the guy. And his brother was holding Muay Thai pads for him. He left it all. And when I was when that came out in the 2000s, whenever that was, early 2000s, I thought, this young man, he's a goofball. And all the kids, they go on these reality shows. Now I realize they were so wise. Family. The, the what? Everything. If this kid would have taken the O-Town contract, he would maybe be a success. I don't know what he's doing now. He may still be a banquet waiter. I don't even know his name. But what I know is he's with his family. Right. I know that he is happy. He's at peace. He probably wrestled with what could have been, but that's nothing compared to the loss he knows he would have had. Well, there is a sense of, okay, so we're, you know, the show is on health, wealth, wellness, and, and, and all that good stuff. Wellness, to me, is the action potential of your health. And that could be your mind. And that could be your, 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 your spirit. That could be a lot of things, right? Physical is guaranteed. But wellness is if you're not feeling secure, if you don't feel love, and if you don't feel the sense of community, you become off balance. And everything that you talked about, when I was in LA for seven years, I was in that world as well. I, I was surrounded by a lot of executive producers and a lot of talented actors and actresses as a personal trainer as well. I was a celebrity trainer. Um, it's a different world. I longed for what was familiar and what was my sanctuary because you and I both talked about having fibromyalgia. I currently still have it and you were able to subdue it in, in your skill set and understanding your body. Well, if you're stressed out and you're not feeling comfortable and you've got emotional, you know, stress is constantly hitting you left and right because you have to pay for your bills, you're struggling, you're by yourself, you're trying to become something and you're working really hard, your wellness and your health takes a beating. And, you know, the emotional state of mind is very important for wellness and health. Yeah. And um, that kid that you're talking about probably knew at the long term he wasn't going to be happy. And who knows what would have happened to his, to his health and his well-being, his mind, his spirit. Um, and those are the people he loved. His mom and dad, his sisters, his cousins. Yeah. I'm moving now. We have to move because of the shutdown and the nature of my... I have two movies coming out in the next two years, two books coming out in the next two years. I cannot do my work from here. No. So we're leaving for the next couple of years. Uh, at least two. We'll be gone for at least two years. And I lived in LA for a couple of years before and it was sorrowful for me. I was depressed the whole time, longing to be back here. When I'm here, I don't long to be anywhere. Yeah. I'm happy. But I have to do my job. And it'll be interesting. We picked not L.A. I'm like, I can't live in L.A. We picked a town in Texas where there's a lot of people from Hawaii that live. In fact, they're going to throw us a luau when we get there. Nice. So hopefully, and they said, Jason, there's so many friends. We have so many friends there. But yeah, that, that young man knew it was right. And, it's, it's, and that's what I'm grateful for. That, and that's all of us. If you're listening to this, you're part of the club. We're, we're charmed. And there's something about our culture that's beautiful that orders you to want the right things. Where when you're in LA, you're being ordered to be attracted to the wrong things. Yeah. Yeah, and you become after a while attracted to the wrong things. Right. Because everyone around you is wanting these things, then you think they're, that they're worthy of desire. But here, people desire family, they desire friendship, they desire community. Nature. And nature, health. Yeah. And so what's beautiful about Hawaii, the most important thing about Hawaii is we are one of the rare communities left on earth, especially in the Western world, even though I don't think we're really the Western world. I tell people that we're not, the, but where our, our desires by our community are ordered to the right things. I think so. And you, you feel that when you get off the plane too, mm -hmm. I mean, that sense of decompression, you know, you, you kind of feel the instant hustle and bustle of where LA is, where you're constantly on high drive. When you come here, things just start to slow down and your body starts to recharge. And we talk about the stress hormone. Um, you can't start building your immune system when you're constantly under attack. I mean, no. I mean, your immune system is shot. 
Um, I think another reason why Hawaii is uh, kind of protecting itself from COVID-19 to some degree, I think a lot of people here have a really good immune system because we live in such a good environment. We live in a very fresh environment. The air quality is good here. We're, you know, the ocean has its magical components too. You get cleansed when you go in that water. I mean, there's so many Eating great- healthy is easy. Yeah, it, I go to the yep. store, I so say, what's the freshest fish you have? Right. Get a quarter pound, right. get a quarter pound of garlic, yep. get there a water, and that's my lunch. That's yep. my lunch every day. The yep. freshest fish, a little garlic, a little kimchi, water. Boom. Boom, down right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think we take it for granted, though. I really do. Um, unless you start to travel a lot more and you see what's out there. I mean, you, you and really that's from, I mean, I'm, I, I normally travel to the mainland twice a month. I'm gone four to five months a year, that's all a over lot. the world, yeah. all over the country, all over the world. So I've been to all 50 states. I've not been to Antarctica, but I've been all <laughs> over Africa, the Middle East, Europe. Yeah, there's no place that in the world I would rather be. I, there's no place that I'd rather be than my neighborhood on the west right. side of Oahu. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. My family lives on that side too. I love, I love the west side. I think it's a, uh, again, it's even different energy from from Honolulu. You go to the west side, all of a sudden things are even slower, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, oh, okay, this is what it feels like to kind of have. Hey, I'm wearing, I'm wearing pants for you. So I dress when I come to the east side. <laughs> that sounded so wrong, though, Jason. I'm not wearing surf shorts, and I, and I have shoulders. <laughs> I'm usually in a tank top and a surfboard shorts. Oh, and that's God. how I drove. This is my fancy clothes. Whoa! Look yeah. at this, and it says, "What does it say?" Wild card boxing. Yeah. Speaking of which, let's you, talk about play. How much time do we have? We got, we got some. We got some time. Um, so you did some MMA, right? Yeah. Well, let's get to this. Like, so my dream was this is how good God is. You know, Joseph Campbell says, when you're on the hero's journey, opportunities come that don't make sense. I call it the Holy Spirit action plan, you know? But I, I since I was a boy, I wanted to fight in the world tournament and represent my country at this four-year full contact tournament. So when I joined the Army and I come to Hawaii, I discovered that the first Kyokushin school outside of Japan was in Honolulu. Nice. And it was this guy, Shihan Bobby Lowe, had a school here in Manoa. And I found my way to it. And I began training with him. And in 1995, I, I went and fought in Chicago, of all places where I'm from, flew from Hawaii, to make the U.S. team. I made the U.S. team. And then in 1995, I represented the United States at the world tournament Whoa. and uh, fought in the Tokyo Dome. It's a big thing, especially then before the UFC. It was a very, very big thing. And it was my life dream. Wow. I actually tore the ligaments in my knee at the, the, the U.S. Uh, at the trials for the team. I didn't tell anyone. So I went there injured and I, I'm glad I did. You know, I was like, I'm going to fight with, and I'll get my surgery after. But <laughs> I... um. Yeah, and so I got to train with Bobby Lowe, who's a legend around the world. You know, and in the 90s, when we talk about play, you know, being here in the 90s, I trained just down the street at Kalakaua Gym in boxing and kickboxing, and I trained with Bobby Lowe in Manoa. Helson Gracie had Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, this is in the early 90s, before even people knew what Gracie right. Jiu-Jitsu was. And everyone here who's a legend today was a young man there training. Right. All of them. Right. Ensign and Egan and Coffey and uh, BJ Penwood came through one time. And then years later, and then I would go to Helson's house. And jiu-jitsu wasn't my thing. I liked the stand-up, but I would train with those guys, and I would go to Helson's house in Ina Heine and roll with him in his garage. Now you'd probably have to write a $1,000 check. Sure. Back then, drop 10 bucks in the hat. Uh, then I'd go to Kalakaua and train. There was a Sizzler across the street <laughs> back in the day. And if I had money, I'd go to Sizzler. If not, I'd get the two tacos for 99 cents. <laughs> Jack in the box. Food of champions. But yeah, but like once every six months we'd go to Sizzler and it was like a deal. I it was, we were so excited. And then I did, and then I got really into my vocation and my work consumed me. And I was living in LA and I was miserable. And I daydreamed about going to the gym again, boxing gym again. And uh, then I made this movie, Crescendo. It was the one I made with Patty Millette. It almost killed me. It was so stressful. And it was for a year. I think I drank every day. At least a bottle of wine, sometimes two or more, for a year. And I got up to 250 pounds. 
And my best friend, who is a really good, he's a war hero, three Purple Hearts, intelligence officer, intelligence officer. My best friend, he said, Jason, you're, the, you're not the man I met. Yeah. You're a weak guy. Your mind's becoming weak. You're letting your body get weak. You're not as joyful as you used to be. He said, you've got to put training in your schedule. So now here I am, 40. This is eight years ago. So I hadn't trained since I was 26. Actually, after the World Tournament, I tried to train, then I had knee surgery. And then I just realized, when I look at martial arts, I say there's three types of people that train martial arts, really train. There's gladiators, warriors, and martial artists. I wanted to be the gladiator. I wanted, I was a warrior for a time. I was an infantryman. Those are warriors. Those are people who train in martial arts because their job requires fighting to the death. Soldiers, police officers, firefighters in their way. And then I got to be a warrior. Then I wanted to be a gladiator. I wanted to go in front of 20,000 people and fight at the Blaisdell. But then after I got injured, I thought, really? No, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I said, you know, that it's not worth it. I want to train for the rest of my life. And so I said, I'm going to have my knee fixed. And then I'm going to get back into it. And I'm going to finish college and this and that. And then one year became two, became three, became four. I went from being perpetually in shape my whole life. If I showed you pictures of me when I was... 12, 13, 14, you will laugh. People laugh. Wait, what? Were you on steroids? I'm 12 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old. I was just obsessed. Yeah. And then training. Then to all of a sudden, I'm 31, 32, 34. I'm getting soft. I'm getting weak. I'm losing my spiritedness. And now I'm 40. And when I went back to the gym, every part of my body hurt. Oh, I bet. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed of myself. And But by the grace of God, I did what my friend said. He said, put it in your schedule. An hour a day, at least three days a week. Now it's an hour a day, five days a week. And I often can't make it to the gym. Well, then I'll just run or I'll do push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups for an hour. But it's schedule. But it's yeah. 12 noon. Whether I can make it to the gym or not, as a warrior hour, it doesn't go away. But for me, what I learned was, more than getting back in shape, was play. Yeah, mindset, again. I get to go in there and do Muay Thai, kickboxing. And, you know... And then what's great about that is that I look at these young men and women that I train with. They are so hardworking. They're so spirited. There's champions. I train at Mango Tree. They have world-class fighters there in the prime of their career. Some careers are getting ready to go off. And some of them will go on to become legends in the sports. I get to look at them. I get to watch them. I get to hold pads for them. They'll hold pads for me. It's such a special thing. In Hawaii, we get that. You get to surf. If you stop surfing because of work, family... You need to go back. Yeah. You need to go to that break your dad used to take you to. Right. Or was did you fish? Or were you in drama? Or did you play the guitar? Yeah. You need to start doing it and get in the community. During the COVID shutdown, some of the young guys I train with, I'm like, hey, I want to pay you to do privates. And I want to pay you. Why? Because I want to, I want to support them in their, in their journey. Yeah. And I'm learning too, but I didn't really need to, to write a, a $1,000, $1,500 check to a young man to get privates. I did it more for him than for me. I was like, you know what? I want to support our community. I'm going to get private during COVID. If I can't go to the gym, I'm just going to pay this young man and uh, we'll train and it'll keep him on his toes. It'll support him through this hard time and it's supporting my sport. Well, here we have everything. We have rugby. We have the martial arts Endless. capital of the world. Endless, yeah. We have every ocean sport. We have the arts like nowhere else on earth. Yeah. Uh, dance. Yeah. Join a halal. So that's the one thing I think, God, I play now. I went from 26 to 40, I didn't play. Yeah. What did I do? I drank. I became mean. Children and animals love me. Uh, kids see me in the store, they wave at me. Dogs run across the street and sit next to me. <laughs> I'm telling you, this didn't happen in those, in those, years those of, late 30s yeah. years. It, it struck me that it stopped happening. And when I got back into the rhythm of being me, of owning some part of my day, I had a meeting with a very powerful politician in Hawaii. I won't say her name. And uh, she found out I skipped my meeting with her. I said, I was, I'm pre-booked. And she found out I was pre-booked because I was going to Muay Thai. She said, really, you skipped me because of Muay Thai? I'm like, well, who on earth doesn't think they're more important than my one hour of Muay Thai on Monday? Everyone thinks they're more important than my, they, everyone thinks they're more important than you going surfing or you doing yoga or you going fishing. They all think you're more important. If you don't put that in your schedule, 
It's never going to happen. So I hope from me being on your show, there's one person Gets who's one like, thing out of I'm, it. I'm yeah. surfing. Yeah. Boom, on the schedule. I'm fishing. I'm yeah. going to join a drama. I'm going to learn how to play. I'm going to pick up the guitar again, pay some kid, give well, me lessons. What does that do? It picks you back to who you originally are, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like when you hear that one song that takes you back to your high school days or to your childhood or that one movie that re- reminds you of what you felt like when you when the world was everything was possible because nothing was restricted because you still had that view of of the world as being so optional to everything you know you're not it's just one of those things where i tell people if you like dancing and that is to feed your soul and you stop dancing because you know things are getting in the way and that one night that you hear that song and you start moving in your kitchen while you're cooking and then all of a sudden the stresses of the world just left you for that one minute or two minutes of that song you that should have been your uh uh-huh i got to schedule something like this for my day every single day so that i can decompress because life is stressful no matter what yeah. you do. Yeah. That's well-being, guys. This is what health and well-being is. This is. It doesn't have to be an, an hour workout. It can be a 10-minute, 15-minute mm-hmm. something. Because what that does is redirects your mind, which changes your emotion, which changes your hormone system, which changes your nervous system, which changes everything structurally and biologically in your body. Just by the way you think and the way you feel, it's that simple. But we forget that because what did you say? We don't play anymore. Yeah, play. I do. I take pictures. I put it on Instagram. I hashtag it recess. Hashtag recess. It's my recess. Every, kids don't have recess anymore. No. We kids took, don't. We took PE out of schools nah, nah, too. Nah. What are you talking about? Nah, yeah. I mean, Crazy. We're, we're not becoming, we're not, we're not letting kids be kids anymore because we, we demand for them to become adults sooner than they have to be. Because of the things that they're seeing on TV, the things that they have to experience in life too soon, because they have to contribute to the family household income somehow, some way at the age of 16 or 17. It's, it's not fair. I get it. But at the same time, you know, if we forget that we're human beings blessed to be on this earth, to enjoy each other and to enjoy our, our journey it's not just about our nine to five job. It's about how are we experiencing life? And if we don't schedule ourselves in our life. Yeah. You belong on your schedule. You, you belong. You your, belong on yeah, your and schedule. And you're a better employee. You're a better business owner. True. You know, True. I um, I chuckle now. You know, things that used to make me so mad on business calls, conference calls. Now I can shrug off and laugh because I felt like I'm giving you everything. I, I There were years in the movie business where I didn't have a second of my life to myself. Mm. The people I had to have dinner with, I didn't want to have dinner with. Right. Every minute of my day being stuck in traffic, going from Glendale to Santa Monica, that was time was lost. I wasn't living where I wanted to live. I, I, so I was angry. I was like, if I'm giving this everything, I should have successes this way, this way. Now it's like, I'm good. I have breathing room. If I think of jujitsu, it's like, Okay, I'm in a position where I can't be submitted. I can breathe now. Blood's getting to my brain now. I'm good now. And I think that's what's what's happens when you take control of your family, your schedule. There are years I don't remember anything with my family. Mm. I mean, I don't remember things. Because wherever I was with my family, my brain was doing budgets. Yeah. I got to get this much money in. Where did this money go? I got to raise this money by this day. And, Sound like me. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's consumed me. I wasn't present. And I hope, I mean, I assume everyone listening to this goes through that. We all, we all go through this. Sure. And by the way, I'm in one of those phases right now. Like this week, yesterday, I had to sit my children down. So I apologize for not being present to you this week. I know I wake up and I'm working from the moment I wake up and I'm working till the moment I go to sleep. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, your dad, and then they're like, oh, we love you, dad. You know, no, no, okay, we get it. But at least now I'm even aware of it. Now I can right. say it's a day or a week or two weeks where there are projects that become all-consuming. You know, if but you're a firefighter or if you're an emergency room surgeon, like we're going to have times where our moral imagination is invaded by our vocation. Right. So true. But you got to bracket that. Yeah. you got to say, okay, you got to put a, uh, what is it, a tourniquet on it. You, you can't let it become weeks, become months, become years I did that. I did, did, did I did do that. For sure I did that. Well, I think if you in, involve your children in your 
part of your life, even though you're busy doing it. They understand it. Like, I, you know, my parents worked a lot. They, they worked seven days a week for 20 years. Um, but my brother and I were a part of it and we understood it. Yeah, we missed engaging with them all the time. But, you know, when we were together, I understood that it was quality time and, and that was valuable. So you, you appreciate the time that you do spend mm -hmm. and you grow up with certain values too watching your parents work as much as they do. You either want to be like them or you don't. <laughs> you're either going to work hard like them or you're not because you're going to try to think of things that are going to be smarter ways to get there without having to work so much. Um, you know, and, and I think honesty with people is another way of being well and healthy. Um, mm -hmm. if first honest with yourself about reality, what's real, not what you want it to be, but what's really, really happening and then being real with the people that you care deeply about that are involved in your life. So once you are honest about what's happening in your current status, in your in your life, in your jobs, then the decisions that you make become much more practical and much more effective and, and more well being towards your existence. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a expert on all uh, anything particular, but I have life experiences and I've also learned to live my life by observing other people's lives and making choices based off of their experiences. And I think for me, um, family is important. That's number one. Also, your your spiritual beliefs is also very important. That keeps you having meaning in life, that there is something beyond this so that you just don't end when you die. <laughs> um, and I think that your um, giving back is also important because the more you give back, the more rewarding it is for you. It's like you're giving yourself a gift back. So sharing your experiences, Jason, and me doing a show like this is my way of sharing my experiences and and trying to push forward, you know, the gifts that I've received in my life. Because I think that's the right thing to do for me, at least. Yeah, that's solidarity, right? That's uh, sharing your life with others. This Shaka symbol, which I love so much, right? It comes from a man who lost his fingers, who drove the train into the plantations and would wave at people, and then he had a hand injury. When he came back to work, people wondered, is he going to wave at us again? And as the train came through the, the fields, they looked up, and he waved, but he was missing fingers. He's doing the shaka sign. Yeah, and so they did it back at him. Do you know that's where the symbol was? Brilliant? I had no idea. And what I love, I use this since I was 17 and almost every photo, it's obnoxious. People go, why do you in every photo? I'm like, well, for me, I always loved it because I think of that original guy. I heard that story when I first moved here. And I always thought of that original guy. And it's like all of us, like, you got your hand, you got your fingers, we got our fingers. You don't got your fingers, we don't got our fingers. There you go. You know, that's solidarity. We're together in all of this. And I think the Shaka symbol, in a way, perfectly sums up Hawaii. I think so, That's too. who we are, and that's what the show is about. And these are rough times for people. Some of us are going to lose our businesses. Some of us are going to be furloughed. Some of us are going to lose our jobs. And um, some of us are going to have to move away. And, and But it's keeping that idea of solidarity and not letting this strange... We live, the moment of history that we're living through knock us from our game. Got you know? it. No, it's 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 not going to be an easy uh, road ahead of us. But I think if we can keep our our mind right, you know, and our priorities uh, in in intact, I think uh, we can get through this. Um, as long as we're here to support each other, like we're like, like I said, we're lucky to live in Hawaii because the people here are amazing. And um, you know, I just want to. I know again. we're this is the saddest part of my show, guys. We're at the end. The end. Oh, it can sucks. I end with a quote? Can I end with a quote? Sure, you can. And an, in an inconvenience is an adventure wrongly considered. An adventure as an inconvenience rightly considered. So, saving our businesses in this time—that's the adventure. Um, keeping our time, making time for ourselves, for our health and our wellness, our joy in the midst of having to work harder or not being able to go in the gym, or whatever barriers, that's an adventure. How am I going to improve my ballroom dancing if I can't go dance with my partner? Right. That's the adventure, figure it out. I got you, man.
God bless you, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on my show. His website is uh, www.movetomovement.com. Um, you know, you guys can reach out to me if you want to get a hold of Jason somehow, some way. Go to befitforhealth.com. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Be happy, be blessed, stay safe, and aloha. Hi, this is Jay Farner, CEO of Rocket Mortgage. Making the right financial decision.